Kurt Fernley, former Paralympian, broadcasting from a Wabakal country. And I'm Georgie Tunney, fan of all things mascots. That's going to be pertinent later, so keep that in mind, everyone listening. And I am broadcasting from Wurundjeri country. And on today's show, Georgie Gamby Tunney explains the human mind in all its complexity. <laughs> you didn't know I was that smart, did you, Kurt? I had <laughs> no idea. <laughs> She's a genius, she's a genius, and she talks about herself in the third person. Also on today's show, Kurt's linguistics are tested when we chat with the four-time Paralympian Mel Perrine about her arch rival and biggest nemesis. I have a gift, supercover fragilistic expialidocious. <laughs> We're gonna get straight into the action today. Uh, what was your new little ripper moment? Oh, again, I can't, I cannot go past Ray Anderson. I mean, am I becoming a little bit of a fangirl for Ray? Kurt, what do you think? Yeah, uh, that is one hundred percent correct. You are. I, I mean, I think, I think that's true. There's no denying that, and I'm not, I'm not mad at it. So, my girl Ray, um, as I will now refer to her, <laughs> friend of the pod, my girl Ray, she recorded another top ten finish at her first Paralympic Games. Her combined time today saw her finish in seventh place in the slalom, which is just amazing. She held her nerve. We know that she was looking to just see what she could do. And that's quite scary to me because she was like, oh, I'll just see how I go. This is my first Winter Paralympics. You know, I previously competed at the Summer Paras, but we'll see how we go with this one. And she gets a seventh place, another top 10 finish. My girl, Ray. Can only give her a standing ovation. Amazing. She did speak about having uh, uh, having issues with her cerebral palsy, with the spasticity in her limbs in that final uh, stretch as well. Mm. And and a, a lot of events you've got to uh, not only fight against the slope, but sometimes there is a variation of disability that can make it an additional layer of complexity. So yes. you know what I I steal a bit. Of Ray Anderson's competition as my no, little ripper moment. You can't. You can't. Oh, no, I'm Sorry. At least ten percent. No, my girl but, Ray. But the other ninety <laughs> percent goes to uh, a Ukrainian athlete, Alexandra Kon- Kononova. Um, it was her first para cross country medal since. 2010 when she won three of them (laughs) and then back today she's able to win another gold medal you know that that is a long time between drinks to be able to keep the intensity in life and training and along that path trying to get that perfect moment that gold medal moment and to get it at a games with the incredibly challenging journey that she would have had to to get there. Andrew Parsons said that there were uh, the the president of the IPC, friend of the pod, when he uh, he said that there will be a movie made of how uh, of how the Ukrainians got out of their country while it was a war zone and got to the Paralympics to compete. And then these performances that just turn up every day. Uh, this one was another standout and it is my You Little Ripper moment. What was your best of the rest? Oksana Masters. Uh, yeah. We may not have got her on the show. Well, we haven't got her on the show. That will be <laughs> rectified at some point. She added another medal today, a silver medal to, in the para cross country to take her haul to six medals in Beijing 2022. An hell of a performance. Uh, all right, best of the rest, Georgie Tunney, where are you at? I have to go for another Australian athlete, and I'm going to say my girl Mel. Mel Perrine heading into her final event, not only of these games, but of her illustrious Paralympic career, four-time Paralympian. She was approaching the slalom runs today. Unfortunately, in her second run, a DNF with her guide, Bobby Allen, but you can just see the camaraderie that they those two have and the relationship between them and you can just see how much each other means to both of them and I think it was even though it wasn't how either of them would have wanted things to finish it was just so beautiful to see them you know hop back up and we're like well look this is (laughs) this is it this is it and hopefully I really really hope that she does have the time now to kind of take that all in and then also, you know, look back and be able to relive her favourite moments and on what has been just such a wonderful, wonderful career. 
we can't just leave it at that. The, 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 we can't leave Mel Perrine, who hasn't been on You Little Ripper before, uh, mm -hmm. as just the best of the rest. We need to speak to Mel because guess what? What? She's right here. Mel Perrine, welcome to you, Little Ripper. Thanks. Your last race, your last day at the Paralympic Games. You know what? I want to. I want to hear both the first run and then the second as well. I think the first run. I think we finished it, um, and we're both like Bobby and myself were uh, quite disappointed. I think like we we went out and it wasn't. It was solid, but it was definitely not anywhere close to what I'd consider a good run, a good, a good skiing kind of effort, definitely below what we've been training. Did you so, always catch Bobby? Well, so you see, everyone <laughs> seems to think this, but the actual thing is I want to be skiing about 30 centimeters off the back of her skates. Really? <laughs> that's where, yeah. That's where I need to be. Well, I can't see her otherwise. Um, so literally the optimal position is my, the tips of my skis, Nelly actually tipping her bindings constantly. So what conversation did you have between the first run and the second? I think we both like, you know, one of one of Bobby's and I's things is like we were always very well, brutally honest with each other, hey? And uh, we got down the bottom, we basically turned to Bobby and said, well, like, well, that was, insert any of obscenity you want here, but it was a lot of them came out of my mouth after that. <laughs> um, and she said the exact same thing to me. Um, so we kind of tore it apart, analysed it a little bit, you know, what went right, what went wrong. And there was some good parts in it, just it wasn't very good all over. Um, and then I think the conversation was, well, where we're sitting right now, it doesn't reflect the ability we have. So we have a second run, we have a second chance. Let's just push out and, you know, do ski us, just do us. We don't need to change anything. We just need to ski how we should be skiing. And we did that for about 20 gates. <laughs> 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 you've got to tell us about the fall yeah. the fall was just the margin of error that exists in ski racing you know you got someone with less than five percent vision trying to navigate around 30 millimeter poles um, coming at a, a decent clip and every now and again an inch the wrong side of the gate is going to get you caught up Tell us about that tough year. I think we've all got an inkling for what it is, but what in particular was tough about this last preparation? One thing about ski racing in Australia is we need to leave the country to train properly, um, basically. And the past 12, 13, 14 years, I've spent six months pretty much every year overseas um, to be able to do my sport at the highest level. And over the past two years, I've not been able to do that. I've not been able to leave and to train and to, you know, prep the way that I would have liked. Um, credit to Snow Australia and everybody who's actually given us the best possible training we could we could have been receiving in Australia. They went, they bent over backwards and turned themselves into pretzels to get us what we needed to as best we could with the snow that we had available. But then coming over, we had a lot of weather issues. Uh, we're an outdoor sport. Um, we can't change the weather we just have to deal with it make the best of it so a lot of weather kind of disrupted our training start right off the season as soon as that kind of cleared up or was clearing up Bobby got a back injury that pretty much put her on the sideline for most of December um, then I've got epilepsy so I was dealing with a few seizure management type things around about Christmas and this at this point in time we've been overseas for about two months and I don't really trained much yet because we, we couldn't like, there's nothing that we could really do. We'd been doing whatever we could little bits here and there, but it just wasn't a full prep, unfortunately. Um, got back after Christmas. I hurt my back. So that was fun. Speed <laughs> <laughs> world champs. Um, again, not the best, but you know, we took some positives from that. We had some good training there. And then basically since the end of January, we've been relatively lucky. We've been able to capitalize a lot and make some big steps forward. Hey, Mel, you talk there about the partnership with Bobby. Can you go into a little bit more deep detail about that bond and what it means to you now having come, you know, having gone to so many games, coming to the end of your career and, and finishing 
finishing with her? The bond between a skiing guide and their athlete is there's nothing like it in any other in any other sport. Um, I think probably the closest you could get would be um, not being able to drive myself. I would assume uh, a rally car driver and their navigator. I I trust her with my life. Um, and as Kurt pointed out, did I nearly hit Bobby? Um, she trusts me not to do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you know we can quite seriously injure each other. We can we can you know we can do a lot of damage, but we trust each other to the point that we know we're not going to do that. And frankly, she's one of my best friends. Like we clicked as soon as we started skiing together and not looked back ever since. We had this awesome open communicative partnership. Um, we work for each other constantly. You know, she's one of the best humans I know. She's fantastic. Can you talk us through the the prep for this? It's your fourth games. You know that it's going to be your last games. Can you talk us through the emotion in the in the last few days? We haven't spoken to you all week, so so we we. I've been you hiding. Know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I I, I think that um, you're allowed to. <laughs> Uh, But the lesson here, Mel, is that we will find you. You can hide. (laughs) Kurt and I will bloody hunt you down. (laughs) Well, I always sucked at hide and go seek, so no no one. (laughs) (laughs) Did you revel in it? Did you enjoy it? Or was it overwhelming knowing that it was your last time in the green and gold? Absolutely everything you just said and more. Um, I... Well, I normally compete all five events at games, or I have in the past three, and I made the decision because of the interrupted prep to really focus in on just two. So that left me with a lot more time at in the in the Paralympic Village than I would usually have. So I was able to really soak in the emotion and just the gravitas of being at a Paralympics. I was able to sit in the stands and watch my teammates compete. Uh, I was able to meet them at the finish line. Um, and I don't normally get to do that because I'm usually like up there competing with them. So um, to actually be able to, you know, be at the bottom of the hill when, when these guys with their first Paralympics, their second, Mitch with his fourth and final as well, um, came over the line and hugged them and, and share that celebration and that like exaltation with them was amazing. I've never been able to do that before. Um, And then I think one thing Bobby and I wanted to do when we came in here was really soak everything in, experience everything, feel everything. You know, I think Mitch, Mitch actually said to me, he's like, well, you can either block it out or you can, you can soak in it and enjoy it and feel all the hurt and all the sadness, but all the joy that comes with being a Paralympian as well. And I'm glad I took his advice. <laughs> um, I try to. He's he's kind of smart. <laughs> yeah, he's not bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's got that emotional intelligence as well, we know. <laughs> oh, yeah, most definitely. Um, yeah, so I've been yeah, highs and lows this week, massive highs seeing, you know, teammates compete for the first time and fall in love even more with the sport. And um, a lot of tears a lot of tears. I think I'm dehydrated from crying so much. This time. <laughs> <laughs> I think every time Mitch and I see each other, we start crying. <laughs> and it's, like, it's, it's, last, it's that last race. It did it to me too. I was saying to Mitch that on the morning of my final race, I just burst into tears a couple of times. I did it yeah. in the room <laughs> before yeah. I looked over the start line. I did a quick cry as I was pushing to the start line. It's like I, I try and there is no equivalent that I've felt that is like so emotionally kind of dragging, but it's also getting you ready for something. Like it's crazy. Yeah. Is it because, is, not, it, is it like I, a sense of, is it a sense of loss that you guys are feeling or within that moment, is it, is it a, the weight of expectation, anticipation, or are you trying to say goodbye, but not quite sure how to do it? Oh, that's wise. <laughs> have, you, have you figured out the answer to that question yet, Kurt? Because I'm not there yet. <laughs> Georgie Tuddy, yeah, you're, you're now my new psychologist, Georgie. Yeah, guys. Yeah, <laughs> guys, you just call me Gandhi. I got this. <laughs> uh, oh gosh, 
it's a sense of loss, you know, but it's a sense of having gained something as well, I reckon. Yeah, you've been co-captain, captain of the Australian Paralympic mm -hmm. team, a, a medalist at the, at the Paralympic Games. And we can't forget sixth in your first event at these games, which I think is a bloody cracking effort. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the what real is test going is to now. overshadow <laughs> all of that, Georgie? What yeah. will? Fast five, fast five. This is possibly <laughs> the hardest oh okay. quiz or maybe oh. the hardest, you know, ever competition that you've, you'll have to go through, Mel. So we apologise <laughs> because of the difficulty, but we're excited to see what you can do. What do you wish you had in the village but you can't get? I want one of those really big shoey Ron Ron costumes, you know, like. Oh we, my like, gosh, like, yes, yes. That, right? Yes. <laughs> like the atheist, like Paralympics Australia has a big Lizzie costume, which by the way, I wore in Pyeongchang. Got to wear the Lizzie <laughs> costume. Great, I, <laughs> um, I want the shoey costume. I want to wear that big head. <laughs> What's your superstition? On my poles, uh, the strap of my poles have a right and a left on them because they, they're different the way they bend and the, the pole, way the pole guards sit in asylum. Um, mm. I cannot put my poles on until I've seen the R on the right, right pole. It doesn't matter if I've seen the L on the other side first and know that my right pole is my right pole. I have to see the R. All right, next one. Who, who is your favourite teammate? Bobby. Come on now. That wasn't me. Oh. That wasn't <laughs> <laughs> you played safe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then, if Bob is your favourite teammate, who's the athlete in the village that you would absolutely fangirl over? Doesn't necessarily have to be part of the mob, part of the Australian Paralympic team, but who, which, which athlete are you just, you love? Henrietta Farkasova. Um, she has been a competitor of mine my entire career. I think we started back in the same, same games. Um, she's been my main competitor for most of my, most of my career. She's always that. She's the one that I push to be, you know, she's always been the one that I'm, I'm like, she's my, we call them nemesis. So like, she's just the one, the person that I'm always trying to like one up. Um, but she's also like the nicest person ever. Like she's so lovely. I, I love her to death. She's awesome. Can I just clarify the pronunciation? Was that, <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. Was that Henrietta Parkazova? <laughs> no, it was not. Um, Far car sober. <laughs> Obviously, Kurt. Yeah. <laughs> oh, definitely wasn't far car sober. <laughs> you can look up the correct spelling later. <laughs> if you weren't the skiing legend, four-time Paralympian, uh, co-captain of the uh, the Australia Paralympic team, uh, and of course Paralympic medalist in in a, uh, snow skiing, what Paralympic event would you be in? Pudo. Okay, so you answered that so quickly. Is this something that you have considered previously? Um, I'm a I'm a judoka. Uh, my oh. my dad's a black belt. I've been training judo for a very long time. Um, I also do Brazilian jiu jitsu, muay thai. I've had a mixed martial arts cage fight. <laughs> what? Oh my god. <laughs> Holy I hell, hell. I really, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but I do not want to meet you in a dark alley. <laughs> <laughs> I'm delightful. Congratulations on your career. It's been amazing to see you um, over the last 16 years. Um, good luck. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I watched your career for a long time, Kurt, and I, it's honestly awesome to talk to you. so interesting chatting to an athlete where uh, they are at that finish line of their career. There are so many emotions running around. I find it so interesting with you athletes because you're, so, you're such high achievers. So seeing you both talk about the final moments of such, you know, glittering careers and still have that sense, you know, Mel's very emotional because it's just happening, but then you're also still emotional and get emotional about it, Kurt, too, because it's just such a special time.
Well, there's very few days that you can zoom in on, uh, especially like five, six, seven years out, and you can go directly to the emotion that you were feeling at that moment in time. The last race for Australia, I can do that every day of the week. I can be there in a moment. And when you see somebody else there, you recognise the gravity of that moment. And, and, and gravity and moments, um, you don't get more gravity than this one as well, Georgie. Because this is the penultimate, you, you, you little ripper. Does it get oh, more gravity than this? I don't think so. You and I have so much gravitas by now, Kurt. Like, we are <laughs> on another level. You try holding us down, gravity. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to all, everyone, for joining us for another episode of You Little Ripper. Remember that this is the most accessible podcast the Australian sports community has ever seen. So if you've just listened to this, don't just leave it there. Jump onto YouTube and search for the show that's on YouTube as well. Enjoy a bit of Auslan. Enjoy a bit of the hilarity of me and Georgie's uh, uh, Just smiles. Again, we have to say the biggest thank you to Toyota for making this podcast possible. They let Kurt and I have a chat. They let us chat to you at home listening to you, Little Ripper. But they also let us chat to all of the amazing Paralympians who are doing their thing over the other side of the world. So thank you so much, Toyota. You back our Paralympians. You back us. And we really appreciate it. And we will be back for the final day of the Winter Paralympics tomorrow. But till then, <gasps> you Little Ripper!